and then um yeah we're gonna get started here shortly so thank you so much for joining us tonight uh i am amanda miller the executive director of the tool library south king tool library to be exact um and i have gavin tymeyer is that right i should have practiced your name um, of course it sounds like that phonetically i guess it's tmeyer tmeyer see yeah so it's like t-e -E, gotcha awesome yeah. well thank you so much gavin um we're going to do the intro to veggie gardening class tonight and i will let gavin take it away i am going to um screen share for just a minute and give you guys the formal intro hopefully this doesn't screw things up for you gavin uh yeah, we'll figure it out. yeah. so uh, yep, that's me. Uh, very similar uniform here. Um, I'm the executive director of the tool library, like I said, slash all the other things, not master gardener, but novice gardener. Um, I know more about chainsaws than I probably do about vegetable gardening. Um, and this is our awesome building. If you guys haven't been by, I would love to have you come by sometime and check out the great tools that we have. Um, please feel free to write down my email, phone number, reach out if you have questions after the class. And I wanted to be sure to share our great little example of our demonstration rain garden um, that the Tilt Alliance helped us install. Uh, it's our edible uh, Taste the Rainbow garden here. So you see some echinacea and some other pollinators. I think there's some tomatoes there growing and then a great little herb garden that Eagle Scouts installed for us in 2020 that's taken off and running like wild. So stop by and grab some rosemary, if nothing else. <laughs> so it's always ready to go. Um, yeah, you might wonder why a tool library is hosting class like this and, um, or you might, might not, it's a very natural synthesis, but we really encourage electric tools. We don't offer anything gas powered. Um, we try to encourage folks to be mindful about the things that they're putting into their gardens, into their yards, into the atmosphere, into our communal spaces. Uh, we encourage the sharing economy, over buying and contributing to carbon impacts, offer tools for building, maintaining. You can read these things. What I'm excited about are the, the food preservation tools that you guys might not know about, which are our uh, commercial grade dehydrators. We have a wonderful freeze dryer and we also have several vacuum sealers uh, and then all the tools you need to get your uh, gardens ready for planting too. So stop by, uh, there's our open hours. They're also on our website and I'll put that in the chat uh, for you guys. And here's our little commercial break, but uh, we are so grateful for the EPA uh, and the Department of Ecology for Washington State uh, for allowing us to continue programming and to be a barrier list that is right free, a barrier list uh, tool library. So we, uh, you can borrow all of these tools for free. Um, we just ask that you respectfully utilize them to their capacity and bring them back in good shape. So with that, I will let Gavin take back control. <laughs> I don't know if it'll be as smooth as I was hoping, but oh, that was great. Pretty well. Nice. All right. How's that? Can you see it? Yeah. All right. Screen? Okay, cool. All right, well, thanks everybody for being here. Um, I heard that my microphone is kind of roomy and muffled. I'm, we're gonna have to work with it, but uh, if any point during the presentation, something isn't clear, you have a question, just go ahead and direct it towards the, uh, just the chat box. So yeah, this is an intro to veggie gardening workshop that I'm happy to help present. My name is Gavin. I work for the Garden Hotline, which is part of the TILF Alliance. Uh, the Garden Hotline is funded by Seattle Public Utilities and King County Hazardous Waste. Um, and yeah, you can call you can call or send us an email Monday through Friday with any gardening questions. It's a free service, so if anything we cover tonight is you know you want to learn more about it, just go ahead and call us or send an email, and we'd love to talk to you about it. Um, I have, I graduated during the pandemic with a master in environmental studies degree from the Evergreen State College. I also have experience doing professional landscaping and gardening, which is kind of, where, I guess, where I, I cut my teeth for this job, so to speak. 
I did want to mention real quick something about just the concept of being an expert versus experiential learning, um, which I think gardening is very much a part of. People tend to think of the garden hotline as experts, and I can't speak for my teammates, but for me, I would consider myself kind of an adult lifelong learner. I do know a lot, but, you know, gardening is a vast world, um, you know, whether you're helping with rain gardens, like I was in the earlier presentation or just edible gardening or ornamental planting. So yeah, it's always, it's always good to think of gardening as just the ultimate experiential learning um, as in you learn from, you know, experience. If you plant something and it grows and it's green and it tastes good, then I would say you're probably doing something right. So All right, so we're going to do, can everybody still hear me? Sounds good. Yeah. Okay, cool. Thanks. We're going to do a quick, we're going to do two, I guess, survey questions at the beginning and at the end, and we'll give you guys a little bit of time to answer these. So the first one is how much experience do you have in selecting plants for small spaces or containers? Um, just go ahead and direct your answer to the chat box. Um, so we'll answer these two questions and then if go ahead and put your name and email address because we're going to do a giveaway or Amanda's going to do a giveaway at the end of the workshop for a indoor composter. Well, everyone is, um, oh, I've pinned you. So I don't know if you can hear me, but let me see. Move the pin real quick. I just was going to say that here is our lovely indoor composter. Woo! It sits right on your on your countertop and you throw all your food scraps in here. And um, it kind of looks like a drink dispenser. Um, so, you know, make sure you warn your children. They don't try to drink this <laughs> stuff. It probably wouldn't taste very good. It probably wouldn't be bad. But um, this is a great donation that uh, one of our volunteers brought for us. and. Uh, we just want to make sure we can pass it on to somebody that would utilize it. So if you guys are all getting your gardens ready, maybe for the first time, you want to try indoor composting, it's a great way to do that. All right, cool. Um, all right, can everybody see the outline presentation or the outline slide? Yeah, looks good. Okay. So we're gonna, again, we're gonna cover a lot in this. I think I, we're gonna cover a lot and I don't expect everything to stick, but you know, we'll have time afterwards for people to field questions or have a, you know, a healthy discussion. So the main things that we're gonna be covering are just gonna be the benefits of growing your own vegetables, which can be a, a very wonderful holistic experience for those who haven't done it yet. Um, and part of that includes choosing your own soil or choosing the right soil, uh, different containers to use, uh, growing conditions that involve sun, light, and water. Uh, vegetables can, you know, based on the season. So you have cold weather vegetables, I guess springtime, and then you have, you know, warmer weather, hot month vegetables. So think of tomatoes, eggplant, uh, things like that. And then ongoing maintenance, which depending on the mindset that you're in is either the bane of a gardener's existence or is a wonderful opportunity for mindfulness. So why do we grow vegetables? This is a good question. This is gonna be unique to everybody. Um, these are some great examples. Uh, saves money. So maybe a good historic example are victory gardens. I'm sure some people know about those, but just that concept of maybe taking the power back within yourself to do it yourself and you know, plant your own vegetables. If you, I would say if you plan ahead, it is a good way to save money and resources. Um, more choices of varieties. So this is a good one. I think the majority, of, it seems like the majority of the kale that we get, for example, from the grocery store is seems like four varieties. But you would be amazed the just the different the, the varieties of vegetables that there are to grow, and I'm sure they all taste different. So 
you know how they were grown. So that one is, again, there's that experiential learning is you get to see something take place from seed to, I guess, fruit through flower and greens. Um, that's a special experience. So that allows you to develop a deeper relationship, kinship with the land. And I think in a way that it provides empathy just for the natural systems that we're a part of. So I think on my end, it took me years to realize that food in a grocery store came from the earth and was you know, harvested by people. Um, I, veggie gardening is a great way to get in contact with that or understand that system more. So, and of course, last but not least, it's fun. And it is fun. If it's hot outside, make sure to wear lots of sunscreen and stay hydrated. So I'm gonna do this thing where I'm gonna check to make sure that you can still hear me from time to time. So if Amanda could just give me like a, hey, you're, we can still hear you. Yeah, sounds good, slide. sorry. Okay, cool. <laughs> It's okay. So let's think of soil as the, the medium, the, the canvas to which we're going to be planting stuff to watch it grow. Um, soil is a big one. I, I think I learned about soil, like the right soil to use from houseplants and actually probably more so the wrong soil to use by just my house houseplants dying through trial and error. In general, um, Soil for containers or container gardening, which is something we'll get into in the next slide, you want it to be organic, uh, uh, well-draining. Potting soil um, is just a good start to look for all-purpose potting soil. And um, yeah, mulch, which is another thing that we'll talk about in depth, but mulch is just a blanket terminology for a type of, I guess, surface or that you would put on top of the surface of the soil or just something that is going to contain the moisture. It could be compost, it could be beauty bark, it could be arborist chips. So there's a lot of different options for that. So container gardening, yeah. So this is an, on this slide we have two uh, options or two examples of can, what you know can be examples of container gardens or container gardening. What I really like about these is their creativity and the fact that they're so compact, which um, speaking from someone who lives in the city um, and just any urban dweller, uh, these are this great almost like reusable objects. So on the left right here we have uh, just this wooden barrel type thing cut in half and painted. Looks like it has uh, just some ornamental plants. And then this may be charred growing out the middle right here. Yeah, this is a good example of just something that someone reused. Um, to the right, these could be tomatoes. It could be uh, potatoes. I, I've suggested this yeah. use for burlap in the past because we were talking about potatoes that love to get everywhere. And we have some burlap. We have some really great roasters in the area that have uh, dropped off some loads of burlap for us in the past. And we do have some right now. So, yay. Yeah, totally. So, but yeah, burlap, uh, potatoes, again, great reusable resource. Oftentimes you can find it for free uh, from coffee shops, places like that. And there's a lot of different other examples. I would say it's pretty much anything that your imagination and heart desires, just get creative. You just wanna make sure it's safe and that it comes from a vetted source. So, and I'll talk about that a little bit in the um, subsequent slides. Another example are just uh, garden beds that you would you know, plant or prepare directly into the earth. Uh, so the opposite of raised beds. Um, there is kind of, if you look at the slide right here, there's almost, almost this raised berm or just section. And that's going to allow for the soil to heat better. Um, so if you're doing, if you're doing a, a garden bed directly into, say, a place that was by your lawn, then you can actually just cover it and cover it with cardboard and some sort of mulch. So like wood chips or compost, 
And that'll actually kill the grass and then you can, over a period of time, uh, the, the grass will just recycle nutrients back into the soil that you're using, which is a great way to, you know, just improve the quality of the soil naturally. Another hot topic, which is a, some, a question that we get frequently at the garden hotline is just going to be the concept of testing your soil. So, um, can anyone think of any reasons why we would want to test soil? And then we can just go ahead and direct the questions to the uh, chat box. Uh, I think yeah, we, any, had, any, we had the ahead. perfect question just came out that uh, the Asarco red zone, so the Asarco smelter um, for um, that arsenic and lead stuff, you know, we've, we've talked about in the past, dirt alert has given some great information, but um, I know that there's some concerns too in the Auburn Valley, especially about um, the former pesticides and herbicides that were used for the larger farming regions. And um, yeah, there's always, always those things. We have even uh, urbanly uh, things like debris from the roads and, uh, you know, uh, tires and oils from cars are more likely to not necessarily be uh, there all the time, but as they're traveling, they're throwing a lot up into our yards and into our common spaces like green belts. So yeah, I love this topic. <laughs> I'll let you go. Yeah, no, I appreciate, I appreciate the input and the questions are great. So thank you for that. So the first one, yes, the Asarco smelter, which is a, a smelting plant that operated in Ruston, which is you know, considered part of Tacoma, probably for about 100 years until around, I think around 1985. And so uh, what the smelter did is it basically, there's a historic plume or just a, a legacy of lead and arsenic that is in parts of the soil, it's Tacoma part of Pierce County, sorry if I don't remember that, uh, and then King County. So Dirt Alert and then the Department of Ecology actually has a, I think it's a, maybe a GIS map that shows uh, just soils that are most affected in, you know, South King County, so Vashon Island, Tacoma, even parts of Seattle. So um, I don't want to strike fear in people's hearts of that, though. I, generally, in industrialized society, I think it's just the reality of being a gardener. You don't necessarily get so much, you, you won't get toxicity from eating fruit or the veggies per se, but just more touching the dirt um, and just it's, it's uh, children, young people are, are especially susceptible. So just the philosophy of, you know, washing stuff that you grow and washing your hands and making sure not to trap stuff in. Um, testing your soil is a great way to just know what is in the soil. And I, I, we got a little off topic, but that's okay. So testing is a great way to, to see nutrients in general, like what maybe your soil needs, whether it's nitrogen or phosphorus or trace minerals. We have some organizations that we work with to steer people towards. One of them is King Conservation District. So they do a soil test for a nominal fee of $25. Um, yeah, and that way you just have a building block knowing what you want to work with. This is important if you're planting a vegetable that's like a high eater, uh, you know, like tomatoes and stuff like that. You don't want to plant uh, those tomatoes in soil where they're not going to have any nutrients. So soil testing is a, is a great way to just know what kind of nutrients you want to put into your soil. Or even just to not beat yourself up. No, it's not just you. You're not screwing up your plants. <laughs> it's, it could be just the soil. <laughs> Now, do you recommend exactly. the the over the counter kind of? Uh, I know I was at that coastal farm and ranch in Auburn, and they had some soil testing kits. Um, is there a value to just pH, or what kind would you recommend for folks? I would say to get a definitive analysis, it's probably good to go with one of the labs that we suggest, but. I think in the spirit of just educating yourself, those at-home soil tests just kind of prime you and get you into that headspace of just wanting to know what's in the dirt. So learning about the pH is cool. It's not the only, uh, I guess, piece of the puzzle, but pH is important because 
obviously plants do well or don't do well in a certain pH. Um, I tend to think more about ornamental plants is where my mindset's at, less gardening plants. But um, if you if y'all don't know our, already, our pH tends to be slightly acidic in the Pacific Northwest, uh, just because of all the rainfall that we have leaches nutrients quickly out of the soil and then all of the coniferous uh, evergreen trees that we have. So it's always great to know pH. So yeah, any sort of soil testing, I definitely endorse. Amanda, can you see the raised bed building material slide? Yeah. Okay, cool. Um, so this kind of gets into the concept. We're going to get into the building, the, the materials of what you know you can make out of raised beds. And I, I talked about this a little bit earlier, just with almost the found material. I personally don't have any experience with the concrete or um, building stuff out of concrete, just the found items. It looks like you want to avoid asphalt. I'm sure that has to do with some sort of uh, chemical or just maybe something that's in it. It might also have something to do with the fact that it's black and it's going to attract a lot of light um, or just suck, absorb a lot of sunlight, which isn't may not be great or what you intended. So yeah, I, what is the traditional, and I'll go into this in the next slide, what is I would say, a traditional uh, raised bed material? But again, you can use anything. It's important that for wood, you want to use non-treated wood. We do get a lot of questions um, from gardeners who, I don't think it's creosote, that's kind of a little bit more intense, but just some sort of wood that's been treated with a chemical, maybe just to prolong the life of it. And I would, we want to stick away from anything that's been chemically treated. So um, cedar and juniper are, are just natural that are going to last longer through that rainy season. Uh, metal materials, galvanized stock tanks, uh, and again, just know your soy sources. So just make sure for any sort of building material you're getting it from, you know, I would say a manufacturer that you know that can be vetted or just from a garden store or a stock store. I usually get a lot of questions around pallets um, and I can speak from a decade in the warehousing industry. You never know what was on a pallet and you never know what could have been spilled on it. So I always kind of warn against using those for uh, edible uh, garden beds, but that's my two cents there. <laughs> yeah. And I also working, having warehouse experience, I second that. I, uh, pallets are not the first thing that comes to mind, so. All right, so raised beds. Uh, this is a picture that was taken. I don't know what uh, pea patch this is. It looks amazing. It's got corn growing in the background. Looks like it has some buildings and some solar panels. But in the, in the foreground here, we have three just examples of what raised beds, you know, look like. Just basic designs. This was taken by our program director, Laura. Um, again, inexpensive, uh, easy to put together if, you know, a little bit about design and you have the materials, which hopefully you can check out from the South King Tool Library. Did I say that right? That's it, that's us, yeah. Or any tool library oh. that's close to you too. There's a few in the region. So we just wanna make sure we're doing the best we can with those, but yeah. Yeah, so um, one of the benefits of the raised garden bed is uh, you can add potting soil directly into it, which is going to bypass the need to, for the most part, to get your soil tested. There are going to be some, you know, other environmental contaminants, but I would say potting soil placed directly into a raised garden bed is going to be the safest way to gardening for the most part. Uh, it is going to warm quicker, which is a, a benefit. Um, yeah, they're just easier. The, the soil is more porous and it's not as compacted. In general, it's just easier to plant other things like that, in, you know, are going to be root vegetables like beets or, you know, going to have the room to grow so there's just there's a bunch of benefits to the raised gardening experience okay so soil soil is a topic that we if we had time we could spend four hours maybe a movie length 
uh, talking about. Um, there's just not enough time. Soil is an amazing thing that we are constantly learning more and more about. And it's probably, as a, a member of the Till family, it's probably the thing that I am most excited to just continuously learn about. Um, and yeah, soil is going to be, the, I would say, the most important element of having su successful garden veggies. So you want to make sure that your soil is well draining. Um, yeah, potting soil. Let's see, so another, another big concept in this slide, if we look at the photo at the bottom that our program director has taken, are cover crops. So this is again, another big topic that we, you know, can't go to in too much length, but um, any sort of soil, let's, let's think outside the box of uh, veggie gardening right now, but any sort of soil that is gonna have plants in it, just to go back to that rain garden that Amanda had shown at the beginning that is at the on the premise at the South King Tool Library, um, any sort of plant that's gonna be grown out of the soil, whether it's a native plant, like say a dogwood, or it's gonna have, those plants are gonna they have extensive root systems that are going to grow into the soil to provide support. And then the green layer of photosynthesizing material on the top, uh, like the cover crop, for example, this could be some sort of wheatgrass, um, is going to provide a buffer from just that constant onslaught of winter and springtime rain that we experience here. So it's going to do two things there. It's going to slow the leaching of um, just nutrients out of the soil over time. This is really important if you're gardening. And then it's actually gonna, um, the, the matrix of like uh, roots is gonna slow down the process of chemical and herbicide leaching um, into our watersheds, which just goes you know, directly into the Puget Sound. So again, concept of a rain garden, same thing for gardening is um, you're really slowing that process of just all the urban industrial chemicals and just stuff that are a part of our everyday life. It slows it from just washing out directly into our sewer system and then into the Puget Sound, um, which is not always the best thing, so. Compost condition your soil. So soil needs to be, uh, if you have soil, this goes back to testing too for nutrients. So soil will grow certain things or it'll, it'll build back certain nutrients over time. But as a gardener, as gardeners, we can speed up that process by adding uh, either compost or fertilizer, organic fertilizers into the soil. So a big thing that I want to push here today is just this concept of composting. Um, when I first started gardening, I was a little confused on the difference between mulch and compost. So this kind of shows, again, I love, happy to wear that expert hat, but it, you know, you always, you learn something new. So um, compost is a type of mulch. Mulch is just a blanket terminology for something that, you know, sits on top of the soil. So Compost is a great way to um, just add nutrients back into the soil. It's going to create, it's going to add organic matter and it's just, a, it's going to, overall, it's going to improve the tilth and just quality of the soil. There's, I have three examples right here of just different uh, garden variety, no pun intended, types of compost that are commonly used um, product wise. We have G&B, Black Gold, and then Cedar Grove. So I did a gardening demo last week at a, um, a, I think it was a mixed income housing place in the university district in Seattle. And one of the products that the, my, the person coordinating the project had bought was composted chicken manure. And so someone had a question, well, are you sure that we wanna put, you know, pure chicken manure onto the veggie beds? And so, for the record and clarification, composted chicken manure is not pure chicken manure, but it is chicken manure that has been allowed to go through the lengthy, you know, composting process. So 
basically turns into black gold. It's safe to put on your veggie bed. You just want to avoid putting any um, animal, whether it's steer, you, mostly at times it's chicken manure, straight chicken manure onto the veggies or onto your veggies for two important reasons. Um, can anybody guess why those might be? I'm going to go with um, some other visitors that might want to come and check out the, the things that they might attract. So I know rats and things uh, generally like to come towards that. And I don't know, I imagine it's probably a different, um, yeah, Lori says E. coli or, you know, probably some mites or, and, and things like that. I, I had basically the understanding that animal like waste needs to sit for almost a year at least that's horse manure. <laughs> so sit for almost a year before you can really use it as compost. Um, but yeah, I'd be interested to see. Uh, and then Julie said burning the plants, which is definitely something that I've heard about. Even just applying compost itself, you can actually fry your plants too. But yeah, those are. Uh, I heard Julie with the burning. What was the name for the first person? Uh, Lori said E. coli. All right, so Lori and Julie nailed it. So uh, the, the two big reasons are the first one that Lori had said with, uh, so straight chicken manure is going to have pathogens in it. So for safety reasons, purely, it's not, it's not at least from, a, from an educating, you know, public health standpoint, um, working with the public, it's not a good idea to apply straight chicken manure just because it's, it's not safe. So it's gonna have a ton of pathogens and yes, I don't know, I can't think of the exact time frame, but I know that it is, it is a, a long process of um, just letting that chicken manure go through that super heated, uh, just composting process where uh, the breaking down of the material actually will heat and then kill all of those unwanted pathogens so it's safe to use. And so I think Julie had said the second one, which is, yeah, you don't wanna plant um, any sort of plants into direct Manure, particularly just because it's so high in nitrogen, it'll just burn the plant. And compost too, um, it's not a good idea to plant seeds directly into compost. So when we're we're putting compost directly, when we're when we're putting compost into the soil, we're gonna apply it, we're gonna to apply a couple inches and just uh, till it into the just kind of work it into the first couple inches of the soil, so it's mixed in with just the all-purpose potting soil or top layer of soil that you have just in the ground. So. Cedar Grove is a is a one that we use often. So what's cool about Cedar Grove, um, from my per, my understanding, is it's actually it's stuff that at least in then at Seattle and I think King County is just yard waste that is from directly from the consumer. So you have a real kind of instead of like a linear exchange, you have a real cyclical like it goes from the consumer, it's um, composted, and then it it's uh, sold back to us, which is, I personally think is a cool concept, so. And here we have, we're back at another one of my favorite topics, which is mulch. Yeah, again, I can't really, can't really say enough about the, you know, the innumerable benefits of mulch. So there's just so much of it. Mulch is really one of those broader philosophies that it's just a great way to conserve resources. Um, and the reason why are, is because applying mulch is gonna create a temperature buffer. It's gonna, it's gonna conserve moisture by keeping it in the ground. It's going to suppress weeds. It moderates the soil temperature, which I've already said. Um, Aesthetic wise, it does have a cool look. So as opposed to kind of an unkempt look, it has um, just, you know, this fella, this picture is probably from the 1980s, it's pretty cool outfit and haircut, but um, yeah, it's just, it, it looks, it looks great. It looks kept really well. And then it's gonna- I'm, Timeless concepts. Go no, timeless concepts. That's just what that is. Yeah, exactly, yeah. Um, and so another, another great thing is uh, mulch is going to create 
a habitat for beneficial insects and birds. And I'm curious if anybody knows, there is a specific type of mulch that Amanda had mentioned earlier um, that is probably the best habitat for birds and insects. Can anybody guess which one that might be? I don't even remember what I said. <laughs> Was it my grass trimmings? <laughs> Yeah, of course. It's another, it's another one that is just a free bounty that comes from uh, nature that we have a lot of, particularly in the fall with deciduous plants. Uh, leaves? Is that a good one? Leaves, yeah. So, yes. yeah. Leaf litter is um, an, another type of mulch. It's free. Um, if, if you can't afford to, or you, you know, for mobility issues, if you can't go to the store, uh, Leaves, for the most part, depending on where you live, we're going to have plenty of uh, just, you know, think about like a maple or an oak. Um, and yeah, so if you think just the, the natural cycle, if you were to go out into the forest, is these deciduous trees are going to lose their leaves and they're going to fall to the forest floor. They're going to create a layer over time. And so that layer of leaves are going to help just kind of buffer all the great just chemical elements and processes that are going on um, just in the soil there. And so if you were to go into the soil or into the forest and lift that up, you would notice a lot of uh, larvae and grubs from uh, all sorts of pollinators. So wasps, um, moths, butterflies. And so, yeah, I think aesthetic wise, um, gardening, maybe we're just kind of taught just for visual purposes to kind of haul out our leaf litter, but there's kind of a, maybe like a renaissance of just keeping that leaf litter because it just provides so many benefits. Um, and there is a way to keep leaf litter like in your garden while also keeping it out of other areas, like if you have a lawn or if it's out of the driveway. So there are options there. Um, and I think that Amanda had touched upon this earlier, but you just wanna be careful with leaf litter that if you use it, you wanna uh, not use it leaf. You don't wanna use any of the litter that comes from a roadside because there are gonna be some environmental contaminants that you, you know, are probably better left just you know, away from. So it could be broken glass if you're in the city or just other things. So always exercise caution if you're using leaf litter in an urban environment. Yeah, so just these are different types of mulch. So in the top, in the top two pictures, we have straw. And this just kind of demonstrates um, maybe like a temperature buffer and just protecting the soil from the sun, from the elements, from the rain. Um, the middle right here, we have a couple of different examples of leaf litter and how it's been used. This looks like basil to me, maybe in the corner. And then this in the right here in the middle left could be blueberry perhaps, I don't know what that is. And so there we go, even grass clippings um, as opposed to dumping them, even if you're composting them in your municipal yard waste bin, they, they, they could serve a better use um, just being used organically as mulch where the grass will break down and just uh, apply the nutrients back into the soil. So soil and mulch resources. Um, for those that don't know, I would say there are two broad categories where you can both purchase different types of soil and mulch. So potting soil, uh, mulch, compost, uh, beauty bark, stuff like that. I would say starting small and local, there's a bunch of great nurseries. Um, they're not listed on here, but you can always call the garden hotline or send us an email and we have a wonderful list of nurseries and just places where you can buy potting and potting soil and compost um, and stuff like that. So the other category would be in bulk. So there's a couple of different example of businesses that sell both compost, uh, potting soil and just any sort of mulch and gravel and stuff like that. Um, the one that I have experienced, particularly with those of us familiar on the South End is Beery and Bark. So when I was a professional gardener, um, this is just the place that we went to with the work truck and they will, they will load up soil. I think it's based on maybe yard. So you can buy a certain amount of yards of 
uh, compost, for example. It's one of the coolest things to see in the late winter when um, it's raining and the decomposition process is taking place and there's yards and yards of compost uh, steaming in the middle of winter. Um, it also smells great too, just that kind of earthy sweet smell is um, one of my favorites. So. All right, so we're going to change gears into um, veggies uh, from soil, just uh, uh, veggie gardening. So this is kind of what we had all waited for. So a couple, just a quick, just crash course on different types of plant life cycles. And there's always, again, there's plenty to learn about this. Um, annuals are plants that complete their life cycle in one growing season so the example is just a tomato you're going to grow that from seed it's going to go through the process of turning green flowering and then bearing fruit and then that is the life of the tomato just giving you plenty uh, biennial is going to be a, a plant that's going to complete its growth cycle in uh, two years so kale is an example. If you were to let your kale bolt and go to flower, um, it would happen over the course of a couple years. Or I'm sorry, uh, I think it's a couple, I think it's a couple seasons. Um, perennial takes is one that takes two years to complete, which is not how I always think of a perennial, but if an apple orchard is just an apple tree, for example. Season length is going to be another hot topic. So um, yesterday I, I helped um, uh, just a mixed income housing unit plant some new kind of cold weather greens. One of them that we planted was uh, radish, which is pictured on the left right here. And so that's going to be a, um, a short seed to harvest time. So if you want something that's fast, that's, you know, maybe again, maybe for children or just something that you want a quick turnaround. Uh, radishes are a good, kind of a good example. They only take a couple months from seed to bounty, I guess. Uh, medium harvest is going to be three to four months. This looks like cabbage to me. It could be a type of lettuce, but I think it's cabbage. And then, yeah, here's another example of just tomatoes. You're going to take quite a while to go through the process of, uh, you know, being heated up by the sun and uh, growing through the summer months to late into the fall actually they'll still bear fruit so um, crop rotation this is another hot topic does anybody have any idea about maybe why rotating crops is important and so just to give a quick example of that um, just not keeping the same not planting the same crop you know whether the same vegetable, whether that's garlic or kale, and the same um, bed year after year. So we all have our favorite vegetables, but why would it be a good example not to do this? And if you have multiple beds, just rotating your crops or growing something different every year. Ooh, ooh, ooh. I'll see if somebody puts anything in the chat, but I think I, I think I know why. Because potatoes would take over the world. Is that not? <laughs> no, I think it has a lot more to do with the uh, the nutrients they take up, and um, you know, you don't want to have the the soil that you're using just like in vast plains. You can have those, you know, reseeded over and over again, and it creates um, uh, unplantable uh, areas. So. Yeah, I always think of uh, the different nutrients. Yeah, that's that's great, Amanda. That's that that is one of them. So, the two big reasons, the two categorical reasons for uh, crop rotation are going to be what's called fertility, so nutrients, um, and then to help with, uh, I guess, pests and, and disease. Let's say dis the category of disease, things that are going to ill and you know prohibit or the growth of your plants. So fertility is just as Amanda had said and kind of touches again on the concept of wanting to get your soil tested. So different plants and as pictured here, different plant families are gonna take up different nutrients. So 
I think the heavy eater is like tomato, stuff in the tomato family. We have potatoes there too. Looks like we have some peppers. They're gonna take up a lot of nitrogen. Um, and then stuff in that cabbage family. A picture of a beet down low, is it a beet? Broccoli, stuff like that is gonna, I don't know if it's phosphorus. Um, forgive me for not, for blinking, but basically different plant families are gonna take up different nutrients. So. Um, if you were to plant the same plant, and we get this frequently, we get people who plant garlic every year, you know, love uh, planting stuff in the, the brassica family, so kale, stuff like that, broccoli, year after year because it's their favorite veggie. What happens is like that specific veggie is going to take up a specific type of nutrient, and it's going to deplete quicker um, over time, and so the soil can't replenish those nutrients, and while you can add things like compost and fertilizer to um, I guess, uh, speed up the process of adding nutrients back into the soil. Um, the next category is just a good reason why you'd want to just rotate, and that's the disease category. So this interesting thing happens where the more and more that you plant a monocrop crop in the soil, um, the more, uh, the higher your chances of inviting disease. So uh, I had an email once from uh, a gardener who loved growing garlic every year. I think garlic's in the alien family, um, or the onion family, I guess. Uh, and so what had happened is he one year stumbled across a really bad rust infestation. And so uh, that disease would actually come in, could possibly come in from a weed in the alien family. But what happens is that soil and those plants, it just, uh, the diseases had become immune to that soil, which had been depleted. So both fertility rotation and um, just disease rotation is just good. Uh, you know, I almost think about it like a stagnant pool versus adding in fresh water. It just helps with um, just changing things up a little bit. And that, that's going to help with just keeping nutrients in the soil and just trying to reduce the amount of pests that are going to try to um, attack the plants that you're growing. So finding information about plants. This is a big one, and this can be confusing at times. And so again, feel free to call the garden hotline if you have any questions. But the best way to you know, know your growing conditions or just to consult the, direct, the packet directly. So good starting point. Um, in the slide here, there's a picture of cilantro as example. And on the back, it's going to have growing conditions or cultural conditions. It's going to tell you what kind of light um, the plant's going to need. One thing that still confuses me uh, till this day and you know, haven't gotten better at it is spacing. Um, it's not always the clearest and, it, you know, somebody wants to take a lot of time planning something or planning stuff out. Um, when we have to do these uh, education workshops when we're out in the field uh, doing community plantings, it can be daunting to, you know, know how, um, you know, the spacing and just figuring out what you want to plant and what based on lighting and water and stuff. So yeah, start with a packet and then, you know, Google and the internet is a good resource to do uh, further uh, research. I would say um, stick, try to stick as much as you can to reputable sources. Uh, at the Garden Hotline, we use a lot of uh, just extension programs, so master gardening programs, universities, which have the education, uh, just comp like element in, the, in their URL or just the website address. So. Yeah, so cool season crops um, broadly categorized as far as things that we're going to be planting in our maritime region. Uh, cool season crops are just vegetables that are going to be able to handle our kind of mercurial, sometimes tumultuous March, April weather. Um, so stuff that can take withstand just a little bit, you know, colder soil temperatures. So that would be anywhere in, you know, 40 degrees, 50 degrees Fahrenheit. And again, I think I was, me and Amanda were talking about this earlier before the class, but just stuff that's going to bolt in hot weather. So arugula, kale, um, stuff that can be great. That's great to plant. 
Um, just right now, that's going to prefer that cold weather. So if anybody had planted chard over the, you know, that let it go to seed or let it just kind of grow over the all seasons, you'll notice that those um, those vegetables like kale and chard do well in the cold weather and will actually grow through the cold weather and then can withstand uh, frost even so. We do a little self selfish promotion of our maritime garden guide. So this is the um, almost biblical reference reference sheet of just any sort of uh, vegetable that you can grow. We do sell this on the Tilth website, and you can come into our flagship headquarters, which is located in Wallingford, and pick this up directly. But this is just going to give you a lot of great vegetables to grow month by month and just uh, planting tips. And so for the months of March and the months of April, um, this is, you know, this will teach you everything you need to learn. I was checking to see if we had any of those, but <laughs> it was, what was it called again? The merits, it's the... Um, yeah, it's, I can't really see myself showing you this, but it's the, Mar it's the Maritime Garden Guide. So, um, this will just give you pretty much anything you need to know about uh, growing edible vegetables. So definitely great stocking stuffer, great birthday gift. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah, I can't speak highly enough of this, so. Awesome. Is there a link for that on your, on the Garden Hotlines website or TILF's website? Do you know? Yeah, if you would, I think the TILF website would be the best place to go to, and I, we just got a new website, but um, just our web store would would have the so the Maritime Garden Guide. I'll see if I can find it and put it in the chat for us. Okay, cool. I can always do it at the end too when we're talking. So, okay. how are we doing on time, uh, Amanda? It's seven like o'clock. Yeah, it's seven o'clock now. So I, you know, want to respect everybody's um, time commitments and appreciate everyone's patience. So. Um, I know you said this class was going to be an hour and a half. So I think we got a little more of the presentation here and then we'll open it up for chat. And we are recording this, so we'll share with everybody if you have to head out, eat dinner, that kind of thing. Um, but yeah, you can kind of keep going, Gavin. I think we have everyone pretty intrigued. Okay, cool. Sweet. Sounds good. Um, so you can either get plants as starts um, or sow them directly from seed. The thing about sowing from seed is you, uh, if you're going to be doing it outdoors, you really want to uh, heed that, that just the weather, not the plant, is something that can be grown as a cold weather vegetable. Um, just some of the stuff that's grown in spring. So yesterday I had planted some radishes. We planted lettuce, spinach. Um, Stuff that needs to be planted later in the season. You don't want to plant too early just because it's still too cold. So um, obviously uh, tomatoes, eggplant, uh, cucumbers, uh, peppers, um, stuff that needs to be grown and started indoor um, if you're going to be doing it from seed with a heat lamp um, and then transplanted first hardened off outside and then put in the ground at a later date. So May, June, um, uh, when the weather is a little bit warmer here. And see, I kind of had started talking about this, but warm season crops as opposed to cold season crops. So um, plants and families that are considered, I guess, warm season, they're gonna need a, a nighttime temperature, soil temperatures above 50 degrees. So. This is usually starting around June. Um, so let's see, not enough warm days to grow from seed. Um, I don't know what that means exactly. Uh, so yeah, then if you're growing them inside, they need to be transplanted in June. So um, yeah, you can kind of see how early you'd want to start them. So start in February and March growing things like peppers and tomatoes and um, okra uh, inside. And you're going to be wanting, you're going to want to use a, a grow light um, and then a heating lamp too, just because it, uh, these plants aren't going to get enough enough light in February. I mean, as I'm sure we can all relate to, just because we're as humans are barely getting enough light 
during that time. So yeah, we're kind of we're kind of past that time, but um, just to go through that in detail. But again, if you want to for next year, if you want to pick up that uh, just the TOTH Maritime Growing Guide, um, it talks all about starting stuff indoors. So. Uh, this, so this slide, the, the verbiage on the slide is a little bit out of order, but again, just that concept of growing, um, you know, stuff like this indoors as a seed and then transplanting it in, you know, May and June into the garden when it's going to be warm enough. So you have tomatoes, some sort of hot pepper, there's eggplant in the lower corner. I think this is okra. Okra is an exciting thing to grow and just um, some sort of, you know, sweet pepper in the top right. Yeah, and then here's just an example of the process of growing tomatoes. A very, a very uh, crash course example here. So February, you're gonna plant them from seed and planters, and then the middle picture right here has just an example of a uh, a grow light set up with heating pads. And if anybody has any questions about um, indoor grow situations, whether it's hydroponics or um, anything like we get a lot of questions about that in uh, just January and February. They do sell some pretty cool commercial kits that um, can be kind of pricey. Um, yeah, that's another hot topic during the winter time that we get a lot of questions about are just preparing tomatoes so you have them ready for the growing season that we're coming up in uh, May and June, so. Selena, my coworker, has put together just a chart here for uh, just the, the variation on temperatures for seed germination. And I'm going to let you just take a look at this and not talk too much, um, just to kind of take it in. You know, again, feel free to have any questions if you want. So, looks like at the top we have um, asparagus, which just shows a range of minimal temperature, optimal temperature for seed germination, and then just you know this ungodly maximum temperature. And then so at the bottom in the square, we have some of those, uh, well, the eggplant particularly would be more of a warm weather vegetable. So this is just gonna show, uh, it's an interesting demonstration of variation here, so. And uh, I always think of like, I didn't, I grew up in Virginia, which is it's a totally different zone and climate and all that stuff, so when I moved here and started gardening, it was quite different. And I, I realized I had to start paying attention to zones. And there's some really great things that grow really well here, but there are some things that I'm like, no wonder, no wonder we yeah. don't. <laughs> and I stopped beating myself up for, you know, uh, certain things not doing as well, so. That's yeah, exactly. <laughs> exactly. So it's probably fun just from all of the, all of the people that have, you know, that live in this area from all over the United States just to have that experience. So we do have such a almost, you know, I don't know if it's Mediterranean or just temperate climate. Um, and we're based on, you know, whether your proximity to wa water, whether that's the Puget Sound or uh, Lake Washington, or um, we have all these microclimates that actually can either add to the growing experience or, you know, prohibit the growing experience. So Microclimates can be um, just the heat that comes off a brick building or a concrete building, and the conversely can be a heat like suck away heat or create like a cold barrier during the winter time. So uh, there are a lot of things to consider when it comes to temperature for just plants in general. And um, uh, yeah, I mean we have a lot more growing options than say my friends who live in you know Minnesota who everything pretty much turns to ice there for a really long time, so. Cool, so we're gonna change gears again from, uh, we went from soil and then we talked a little bit, we talked about, you know, veggies and now we're gonna go from ongoing maintenance. So maintenance is a big thing with gardening and gardening in general and particularly for vegetable gardening. So. Looks like in our next slide, we have the soil testing, which is a, a theme that we presented in the building and in the beginning and has been in the back of everybody's minds the whole time. So 
Soil testing, again, just a concept that we've already covered, nutrient analysis and toxins. Um, ANL Laboratories is in Portland. And so if you were to get your soil tested through King County Conservation District, which also has a lovely native plant sale, just to plug that, um, they would take their, they would send the soil to ANO labs. And this is a, uh, just kind of a, I guess it shows the scientific and uh, chemistry complexity of what is happening in your soil. Um, admittedly, it took me a long time to figure out how to decipher this. So if you were to get, if we were to suggest a soil analysis for you, uh, my advice is to, if you can't understand it, and you're not feeling ambitious, which is okay. Go ahead and send your soil analysis to the garden hotline, and uh, both Selena or Melissa uh, or I will, you know, spend four grueling hours sweating bullets trying to figure out how to decipher it. But after a while, it becomes easy. But yeah. This is I like I like this picture just because it's a pretty. Um, just user-friendly visual infographic of what is going to be in your soil and why you'd want to get it tested. So we have nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium among things like pH and you know other elements in the soil. So nitrogen is going to be good for just the you know the foliage of the plants. It's something that plants use to create chlorophyll, which is part of the photosynthesis process, which allows plants to capture energy from the sun, store it, and then uh, allow, I guess, secondary primary consumers like us, humans, animals, to eat it. So if you think about it, it's kind of a special way for us to eat energy that has been captured from the sun, which is pretty cosmic. Um, Phosphorus is used in the development of flowers. Looks like there's some complex uh, just RNA and DNA stuff that phosphorus aids in. Uh, it's good for root vegetables, so you know things like beets. Um, let's see, turnips, and then potassium. So it's going to help synthesize proteins and carbohydrate. And so those heavy eaters like tomatoes peppers, eggplants are all going to love just that amount of potassium and just kind of nutrients all around. Fertilizer. Uh, I would say in general, I'm not going to get just because of time. I want to have enough time for questions afterwards. So fertilizer, my big thing about fertilizer is just a, a just in our, our bigger philosophy is the garden hotline and just Seattle Public Utilities. Um, resource conservation and the reduction of pesticides and herbicides and just through um, garden education is if you're going to use fertilizer make sure that it's organic and um, there are benefits to using uh, maybe granular fertilizer versus liquid fertilizer so granular organic fertilizer is going to be something that is going to um, almost have a it's going to have a time release uh, with it by proxy of the way that it's designed so it's going to it's going to release more slowly into the soil and that's going to um, just prevent just you know particularly nitrogen from just running straight through the soil into the watershed or any sort of creek that's going to have salmon or um, yeah we really want to push organic and just natural ways to fertilize the soil through compost and just leaf litter grass uh, cover crops which you can you know cut down depending on the season and that'll just create almost a natural fertilizer. But if you do have to use fertilizer, use organic and I would say look for um, slow release fertilizer. These are some great examples. Awesome. Go ahead. I was gonna say maybe at 7.15 we can shift to some questions. We got some good ones in the chat for you, Gavin. So I just don't want to miss those. Yeah, um, okay. I think, yeah, let's go ahead and open up to, we have, I think we have probably about, watering is gonna, probably the most important thing, we should have done that first actually, but um, <laughs> well, water, yeah. water, 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 like water every day. Um, 
And there's so many great ways to water efficiently. I would say, let's see if we can save those for the, the chat, but always you can feel free to send a follow-up question. So I'm gonna stop sharing now. Does that sound good, Amanda? Yeah, I think, yeah, cool. there's always some good questions when we do like our rain garden classes or any of that. It's, uh, watering always comes up, but um, yeah, so some good questions. Let's go back here. I'm gonna try to go, uh, well, I, I might start at the bottom. So there was a question from Sherry, uh, and you guys can feel free to unmute if I'm not articulating your question correctly, but uh, Sherry asked about planting in pots. Do you really wanna stick to basically one veggie per pot and uh, spacing wise, particularly like a 15 inch pot? Yeah, that's a good, that's a good, um, that's a good question. I would say in general, there's, there's actually going to be some varieties of like a carrot, for example, that's going to be engineered to grow better in a pot. And you're really just gonna, as the, as the blueprint unchanging information, you want to consult the, the uh, packet just to see what the spacing is. If the spacing is something that allows for the pot that you have, then I would say go for it. Another thing that you can do is actually plant like a combination of root vegetable and then flowers in the pot. So they're not going to be competing for the same space. So I would say that's a almost like a, a, a efficient um, way to ergonomic way to utilize space. So yeah, I know there's there's partner planting that you can do some traditional, you know, not necessarily in pots, but the the triad is something that's always we always come up with uh, with corn and beans and um, you know a squash kind of combo, um, and then in containers, um, Sherry, you you can unmute if you'd like, and you can ask your questions about pests and raised beds, or um, would that be okay? Uh, about go. about raised beds. What about raised beds? Oh, sorry, that was Scott asked a question. Um, I thought you oh, had a question. Yeah. Did, did Gavin answer your question about? Scott? I think so. I didn't quite understand the words he used when he said who to consult with what plants. You know, what multiple plants could go in a single pot? Yeah. Well, you can always you can always ask us. I mean, I think just for time, there's so many different examples of companion plantings. Um, you could do like a root vegetable and then do some sort of flower, which uh, is just gonna attract pollinators. But yeah, as far as like pots, um, it's the I would say just consult the the label of the you know the oh the, the label plant. yeah the label yeah. Yeah, and I think kind of a simple way of thinking of it is some things go down, root vegetables, and then the things go up, right? So like your kale, you know, you might put kale in a pot with uh, a root vegetable because it's not going to be competing necessarily in the same way for, for, um, for what they're looking for. But then again, okay. you know, their soils might require something different too. Um, so it's kind of a, you know, test till your heart's desire. I like to say I have a sacrificial garden where um, <laughs> you know, we, we talked, you said something about spacing and I usually plant too much in my garden beds, uh, but I welcome the slugs and I welcome the bugs and I welcome, you know, all the, all the stuff that's going to be coming inevitably uh, so that I know I'll get something, right? If I plant my lettuce too closely together, by the end of it, there'll be slugs on part of it and I can pull those out and then I can pay better attention to other things. So let thinning, right. let thinning kind of be your friend with those instances too. Like carrots are always hard because carrot seeds are so small and you can never yeah. get those properly spaced, so. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, of course. There was a question, so Scott had a question about um, using raised garden beds, do I need to pest proof? And if so, how? And I'll let you kind of run with that because I had a mole that still jumped into my <laughs> my beds uh, and went for it. So any good tips there, Gavin? Yeah, so I mean, the, the, the full range of pests is, you know, there, there's all sorts of them. So I mean, 
I think of bunnies first. Um, so depending on if you have lettuce, I mean, I know it sounds like a terrible stereotype, but I mean, any sort of bunny food, uh, you can always put some sort of mash or not mash, but any, any, anything that's really going to act as a barrier that isn't going to affect the way that plants can grow or get light. Like, yeah, totally. Um, when I was gardening, we actually used like a bunny repellent, which I think was like eggs and like garlic. It's pretty smelly though. And I don't know. I don't actually know if it's supposed to be used on garden veggies. So it just depends on what pest you're talking about. There are some kind of natural ways. Um, I think there may even be some like flowers that you can use, like if you have slugs. Uh, my colleagues know a little bit more about slug traps and stuff like that. Um, Varying beer. The, the beer burying that a little bit in a recessed area, or even I just use those cheap plastic um, uh, liners, plant, um, or, you know, they, they you get them kind of for free and they, I usually use those in the garden and catch the slugs and um, there was another question Julie had, which might tie into this, but marigolds um, that are a good deterrent for some plants. And I know there's other partner plantings. I know calendula is a good, um, uh, pollinator and kind of barrier to things. Um, and mint, of course, in a container can be a good deterrent too. But some of those partner plantings, like you were saying, like even planting garlic with some of your uh, like bunny, <laughs> bunny attractors can, can help prevent that. Yeah, so that, that concept, again, of companion planting like calendula and the marigolds is um, I think if you have the if you sit down and you have enough time to plan it out, uh, it can be done in like in a smart way, so you can benefit from having flowers and then also thinking about things that are going to naturally just deter pests. Um, and I find that I, surprisingly, when I'm doing research for some of our patrons or people who use the service, um, Washington State Fish and Wildlife has a, just good resources on garden pests. That's just my I mean, all the way from like elk to like grazing animals, like down to like slugs and um, stuff like that. So, and there's, there's so many of them. There are too numerous to list here, but you know, as far as bugs and stuff, but there are a lot of beneficial insects. So yeah, I, I guess just doing your, the internet is a wide uh, range of resources for it, taking care of pests, so. We could do a whole another hour <laughs> on just or yeah. several hours on pests. I know, um, not is it aphids? What are the moisture drinkers? Is that um, aphids or they always cluster on my lupin? And I, oh, I yeah. love lupin, and I um, people have really uh, gone wild with pesticides to try to get rid of those and. I have had really great success just using the garden hose and spraying them off. They attack to kale to, you know, any leafy uh, thing that has some moisture in it. They just suck the moisture out of it. Um, and so I'll use, um, oh my goodness, it's an oil or neem. Is it neem oil? Yeah. yeah. Neem oil is great. And I know that deters other pests too. Um, the, <laughs> so what Stephanie said that uh, her mom uses Irish Spring soap to deter deer. <laughs> yeah. I don't have too many deer in Federal Way, but <laughs> <laughs> maybe in other areas. And uh, yeah, that would probably prevent other things too. So um, you just want to be aware of like how that decomposes and breaks down and might get into other, um, might affect your crops growing because it might not like the, the, um, the soapy compounds that come off of it. So maybe putting it in a sock or something that's going to stop it. Um, I know that was something we used to do to stop deer in this spot. <laughs> yeah. yeah, there's all kinds of questions that we can go into with the, the pests too. Were you going to say something, Gavin? Oh, I just remembered uh, we do have uh, kind of survey questions for the end. Do people mind answering those? I know it's kind of a Oh yeah, there was also a question about watering yeah. container like plant yeah. veggies. So any tips on that, how to not drown, but also consistently, you know, uh, be giving them the right amount of water. It's hard to know when you have those containers and you don't have as much flow 
as opposed to like a bigger garden bed. So what's your thoughts? Yeah, I think that, that's a good question. And again, just that, that concept of just experiential learning, which is really fun. So watering, even for me, is a continuous struggle. I, I've gotten better at it over the years. So if you're having a hard time with watering, I just know it's not you. It's It can be challenging. So I would say with containers, particularly depending on the size, you really want to think about it from like almost like a systems perspective or like a big picture thing. So if you go outside, you want to pay attention to the light, like how much light is it getting? You want to put your fingers in the soil and like see if it's moist, if it's like super dry, like think about the season. Is it summertime? Like, is it is the sun going to be bearing down directly on your you know, garden vegetables? You can get a moisture thermometer as a really helpful tool, tool and just the life cycle of where your plants at. So um, watering is a, it's funny that I, I missed the tail end of it. It should have been in the, the, I guess the beginning of, but there's, there's so many different great ways to water. I would say just using all of your senses and don't be afraid to like get your hands dirty. Um, and mulch. So mulch, 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 that's going to be a great way to keep that moisture in from evaporating during the summertime. Um, and it's going to create a temperature buffer. So it's going to just create or just allow that water to stay in the soil as opposed to evaporating. So I can't say enough about mulch just to help in that uh, just process of uh, uh, just, you know, conserving the resources and watering smartly. So and that's a big thing that we talk about frequently here. So again, if anybody ever wants to wants us to send any um, like literature, we'd be happy to do that. But that's one of our core components. So it's just learning how to water. So yeah, I know. And the other thing I I learned from Selena with our container gardening classes in the past were the materials that your containers are made out of. So you have if you're using plastic pots, just you just like if you were using um, a plastic based material, it's not going to breathe as much. You're not going to have as much airflow into the bottom of your container as opposed to wood or even uh, terracotta or uh, other like air permeable things. So if water isn't coming out of in a porous kind of manner, then it's know that it's going to be contained more and your soil too, right? Like filtering down if your soil's sandy or maybe not quite sandy enough um, then you might have less or more drainage so um, yeah just play with it I guess I know I move pots around all the time on my deck when I have to have different plants growing uh, closer to the house for warmth um, and then some of the things that go into the garden I, I smell right like I can smell if the mildew or something is kind of collecting at the bottom <clears throat> So that's always a telltale sign. But yeah, do we want to ask those um, those other poll questions? Or? Yeah, and then we got to talk about the giveaway thing, right? Yeah, um, I, I wrote everybody's name down that put their name into the chat because I assumed that everybody that wrote their name down was interested in the indoor composter. If you did not put your name in yet, go ahead and do that. Um, and I can, if you could include your email address just in case you get kicked off before we get this, or you have to go very quickly to go to the bathroom, whatever the case is. But. Can you see the uh, questions? Yeah. I'll let you explain. Okay, so, yeah, so these are just kind of our, our concluding questions and we would, we would appreciate uh, uh, you answering them just because it'll help kind of uh, our understanding of how we're teaching people and just ways that we can improve. So. Yeah, the first question, how much did today's talk on gardening add to your learning? And the second question, what do you plan to grow in your garden? That one's a little bit more open-ended and fun. I guess you have to choose one of them. So, uh, yeah, so I'll just give you a couple minutes to answer them and we could always, um, you know, I think while we have this up, we could always field questions too if people want, so. Yeah. Uh, someone did mention an app to a seed to spoon. I hadn't ever heard of that one. How about you, uh, Gavin? Have you heard of that app before? I have not. I we use lots of uh, plant identification apps, but I have yet to dive into the world of, uh, I guess, gardening veggie apps. What is it? What is it about? Yeah, I'm not sure. It's just, it's seed to spoon. I went ahead and downloaded it because it seems like it has a lot of information about like planting 
um, you know, when to start certain things depending on your zones. So it might be something where you can kind of plug in your zone and then um, be able to determine things a little bit more or um, maybe I always, you know, there's a big variable in people's backyards, period. Like I have a ton of trees in my backyard. So yeah. it's hard to know. I have to really look at the light and what uh, is going to be getting a few hours of light. So. Yeah, it sounds like a great research. Yeah. Uh, what plant identification apps do you utilize? I've got kind of into identifying some native um, native herbs and um, and quote unquote weeds or maybe some competitors for for things. So I'd love to hear what what apps and things people utilize to identify um, plants. I think if anybody is curious, I believe that King, the King County Noxious Weeds program, um, they either have or they're developing an app that allows you to identify uh, noxious weeds, which would be weeds that are, I guess, particularly bad for the local ecosystem. Yeah, we do have some noxious weed guides here at the tool library too. And <laughs> I found, I thought I had that North, that uh, maritime one, but I just have this growing food in the city guide that the city of Seattle, it got this from Tilt Alliance folks, but we're not technically the city of Seattle, but we're close enough that the microclimates are similar. <laughs> yeah, I think those concepts are transferable, so for sure. Well, looks like you got some good answers to your questions. How about we, uh, 729, let's pick somebody to, uh, to, to get our indoor composter. And you do not have to be present to win, but it helps. And I got a lot of names here. So I'm gonna, I put everybody's name onto a piece of paper and I'm gonna randomly choose one, not looking. See. All right, ready? Chris Eddy, Chris Eddy. I think they put their email into our, uh, into the chat, so. And I don't think they're here anymore. So, oh wait, no, there they are. Yay. All right, Chris. Cool. You can come by the tool library sometime to pick up your indoor composter. I'll email you, uh, so make sure you know our hours and address and all that good stuff too. Awesome, yay. Lots of good feedback here, Gavin. I'm gonna go ahead and stop recording. Thank you guys so, so much for uh, spending your evening with us and uh, thank you Gavin amazing presentation so